I think we've had a wonderful, wonderful day already, and having read the remaining papers, I can assure you that we'll have an equally wonderful uh, set of uh, discussions in the afternoon. Uh, this is really the type of things that we at the Frederick S. Pardee Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future uh, want to do. We want to tackle the big questions, the bold questions, like where is China headed? But we want to tackle them in intellectually robust ways, in ser with serious scholarship, with serious foresight, but also with a serious um, footing in the realities both of today and, and of history. And I think that's what our, uh, what our guests uh, have done for us today. We've had two panels, and we're going to have two more panels uh, in the afternoon. Uh, later uh, in, in, in the conference, maybe Joe will mention more about it towards the end of the day. Our hope is that we will turn, uh, Joe will turn, uh, along with all the authors, uh, these papers into an edited book. In fact, we are very lucky. We already have a publisher uh, in hand uh, who, is, uh, who is eager to, to do that for us. I say that partly because Although the papers have been distributed and you all have access to the papers, some of them say so, others may not. They are all works in progress, and so therefore, if you use them, use them with, with due diligence uh, of, uh, of work in progress. But again, sort of it is, it is I think, a mark of, of, of the type of direction that we are trying to uh, go with this conference. Uh, the, the Frederick Esparty Center has had, a, uh, has had a wonderful and busy year, a wonderful and busy semester. This is the last of our major events in the semester. Through the semester, we've been having multiple seminars on a whole host of issues, ranging from the future of Latin America to uh, technology and development to issues of food security. Earlier this year, we had a extremely exciting set of uh, distinguished lectures uh, from this year's uh, visiting professor at the Party Center, Professor Simon Levin, uh, who talked about complexity and cooperation in both the natural uh, and the political world, if you will. Uh, so so we, are, we are delighted to, to, to have you all here. I won't say more about that, but I have the distinct pleasure uh, of, uh, of introducing to you uh, the provost of Boston University, uh, Dr. David Campbell, to say a few words about uh, Boston University and its commitment uh, to issues of global importance as a global university, as a large university with a very large number of international students, but also footprints uh, all uh, across the world through its intellectual uh, endeavors. I'll ask him to do that in just a minute. But just to let you know what the program is, we'll hear from uh, Provost Campbell in just a couple of minutes. And uh, after that, we will have lunch. And post lunch, but uh, when dessert is being served, I will ask uh, Joseph Fusmith, who's organized this wonderful, wonderful conference, uh, to introduce uh, Ambassador Roy, uh, who will be giving us our keynote address. Since this is the peak of the day in terms of number of people here, David, before I introduce you, I did want to thank uh, just, just a couple of people. There are many, many people who've made this, this possible. Uh, Lindsay Jones, I don't know if she's in the room or not, our administrator, thank you very much. Many of you, Heard, heard from her. I wanted to thank her. I especially wanted to thank uh, Georgia. Uh, if you can just stand up and take a bow. Those of you who are participants have heard a lot from her. Uh, Georgia is a, a research fellow. Thank you. Thank you for all the work that you've put in in putting the papers together and putting all the organization together. We have a number of other BU students from BU student groups. Uh, and I won't remember all their names, but I know Carlos, I know Monica, and I know there are others too, and lots of party center fellows have also helped a lot in that. But the last, I did want to take this occasion to, to, to thank uh, Joe Fusmith uh, for bringing all of you together here. Uh, for, for, for always having a smile on his face uh, and for always uh, finding ways to make the conference even better than uh, what we started with. So thank you very much, Joe. And with those, if I might invite uh, Provost Campbell to just say a few words on behalf of BU. Thank you very much, Adil. And indeed, my remarks will be brief. Uh, it's my pleasure on behalf of President Brown and all of us in the senior administration to welcome you to this luncheon portion of uh, this exciting conference, which, as we all know, is hosted by the Frederick S. Pardee Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future. Uh, I would like to acknowledge several people. Some have already been acknowledged, but I think it's uh, our responsibility to do that again. And first, to Fred Pardee, 
uh, whose foresight, vision, and generosity in establishing the Party Center has enabled us to build a, a very strong nucleus of longer range interdisciplinary policy research and analysis, and it's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, second, to Professor Joe Few Smith, uh, who's a, of the Department of International Relations, who is the lead organizer of today's conference. Third, uh, to Professor Adil Najam, the director of the Party Center. I'm very pleased when we were able to sign him up last year. I, play, I played a role in that, and I'm happy one of my great accomplishments. And certainly uh, not least, but last here, Ambassador Stapleton Roy, who will be your keynote address speaker, a former U.S. ambassador to China and a, a worldwide respected uh, China expert. It's uh, most appropriate to hold today's conference here at Boston University for a number of reasons. Boston University is and has been a global university. This is reflected in our um, curriculum, our student body, our alums, and our faculty. Um, it's also reflected in the formation of the President's Council on the Global University, which is chaired by uh, Dean J. Halfond and is composed of leading scholars in our academic community, uh, challenged with addressing President Brown's question, what should Boston University's global strategy be as a leading private research university in the world? Uh, the Council has been and continues to examine uh, the international nature of our institution, um, the appeal of developing a greater presence abroad, uh, the approaches to potential partnerships, new overseas sites, and of course the academic and financial factors in making uh, global commitments. Historically, Boston University has had a particular focus on China, and we continue to develop this focus. Uh, we do this through our teaching, which has a large number of courses across a wide range of departments on Chinese and Chinese uh, society and history. Through our faculty and research, uh, a, one of, uh, a great example of that is this conference. Uh, of visiting scholars, we have a total of 187 Chinese out of 1,032. That's about 18% of our scholars come from China. Through our students, both uh, international enrollment and international programs which send our students abroad to China, uh, which enrich the lives of all of us here. About 15% of our international enrollment uh, comes from China. That's 750 students out of 5,000. And finally, uh, through our alums, who have recently formed a very active group in China, and last, Jan uh, and last uh, January welcomed President Brown during a recent visit to China uh, with a donation of a million dollars. Uh, toward the university's financial uh, future. So very active in all, report, all, all areas. Boston University is very proud of its past in international programs. Uh, our first president, William Fairfield Warren, traveled widely in Europe, studied in Germany, uh, actually brought back the structure of the German Research University to Boston University, became a, pa a pastor of a Methodist church in Wilbraham, Mass., and was appointed our first president in 1873. He created what he called a distinctive new university combining the breadth of American liberal arts education, the inclusion of professional studies typical of the British university, and the focus on original research of the German university. That's the, uh, the synthesis we uh, have today uh, generated by William Warren. Uh, we established the first study abroad program in America in the 1870s. We're also proud of our present. We have 83 study abroad programs in 37 cities. 24 countries, and many more on the way. At the moment, we have three programs in China based uh, in uh, Shanghai at Fudan, and we're talking with people at Beida about other programs. In the fall of 2008, approximately 10% of our student body, uh, incoming student body was international, with 70 countries represented, and we have students from 140 countries around the world. And toward our future, we're increasing the number of faculty with interests who conduct and consult abroad. And through institutions like the Party Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future, we're reaching out to the rest of the world. This conference is a wonderful example of that. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention and hope you enjoy your, note, uh, your lunch. Shei Shei Ni. Now, it is my real distinct pleasure and honor to introduce to you Ambassador Jay Stapleton Roy. Uh, Ambassador Roy was born in Nanjing, China. Uh, he was son of a missionary parents in Nanjing. And in 1956, he graduated magna cum laude from Princeton University, where he majored in history and was elected to Phi Beta Kappa. Uh, his career since then has uh, reflected that wonderful start. 
He retired uh, in January 2001 from the Foreign Service after a career spanning 45 years uh, with the U.S. Department of State. He is a fluent Chinese speaker, uh, and he spent much of his career in East Asia, where his assignments included Bangkok, twice, uh, Hong Kong, Taipei, Beijing, twice, uh, Singapore, and Jakarta. Uh, he also specialized in Soviet affairs and served in Moscow at the height of the Cold War. Uh, and before taking up Russian studies, he was one of the first two foreign service officers to study Mongolian. Uh, are, do we have any Mongolians who might test? Uh, never mind. Um, uh, Mr. Roy rose to become a three-time ambassador serving as the U.S. Uh, top envoy in Singapore, 1984 to 86, the People's Republic of China, 1991 to 95, and Indonesia, 1996 to 99. Uh, in 1996, he was promoted to the rank of career ambassador, the highest rank in the Foreign Service. Uh, ambassador Roy's final post with the State Department was as Assistant Secretary for Intelligence and Research. Uh, in September of 2008, just a couple of months ago, Ambassador Roy joined the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars as director of the newly founded Kissinger Institute on China and the United States. He continues in his position as senior advisor to Kissinger Associates Incorporated, a strategic consulting firm which he joined in January of 2001. In 2001, he received Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson Award for Distinguished Public Service. Ambassador Roy is a director of Freeport, McMoran, Copper and Gold. He serves as a chairman of the United States Asia Pacific Council Chairman of the Council for the Hopkins Nanjing Center for Chinese and American Studies, and Chairman of the International Advisory Council of the Center for Northeast Asian Policy Studies of the Brookings Institution. He is a Vice Chairman of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, a trustee of the Asia Foundation, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and the Joint Center for China-U.S. Law and Policy Studies, and serves on the boards of the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy of Georgetown University, the American Academy of Diplomacy, and the U.S.-China Policy Foundation. He is a distinguished senior advisor to the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. In other words, Prof Ambassador Roy has been watching China, Asia, and the world for a very long time, and I can think of nobody who has watched it and observed it with more care and more intelligence than Ambassador Roy. It is a real honor and pleasure to welcome him to Boston University today. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you, Professor Fusmith, for that extravagant introduction. You mentioned some positions that I had forgotten that I hold. <laughs> you failed to mention that I, of course, specialized in the communist world. So I am probably the only American who was disappointed to see the Soviet Union collapse and China <laughs> move on to reform and openness because I've now been rendered obsolete and I'm trying to develop new areas of expertise. I was trained as a historian, in which case you look into the past, and now we're supposed to be deciding where China is heading, which requires you to look into the future. And while everybody knows that the future is determined by the past to a significant degree, it's like the stock market. You simply can't predict, based on yesterday's performance, what the stock market will do tomorrow. And that's going to be one of the important themes of my comments. Participants in a conference of this sort are well acquainted with the remarkable changes that have taken place in China over the last 30 years. We know that China's future will be profoundly shaped by what China is today. At the same time, it's equally true that the state of the world will be a critically important determinant of how China develops over the next few decades. China's breakneck economic growth could not have occurred in a hostile environment in which China was denied access to the vibrant markets of the world's developed countries. Nor could China have accomplished so much without the enormous flows 
of foreign direct investment into China and with the jump start provided by being able to educate tens of thousands of China's best and brightest students in the advanced academic institutions of the West. So this was not done by China alone. China took advantage of a compatible international environment which hadn't existed in the earlier period and actually improved with the end of the Cold War and a lot of China's growth shows skill in managing this shifting environment, but it couldn't have been done by China on its own. On its own. So therefore, as we consider where China is heading, it makes sense to look not only at China, but at the rest of the world. Now, as those of us from Washington are all too well aware, within barely six weeks, we are going to have a new administration in Washington. And it's going to begin in a very untraditional way with the United States facing a severe crisis. The worst economic downturn in 70, 80 years, unfinished wars, which have not been traditional during transitions, the worst relations with Russia in the post-Cold War period, nuclear proliferation problems in North Korea and Iran, an undiminished terrorist threat, and all of the other global problems, global warming, environmental issues that are affecting countries throughout the world. He has recognized that his administration must get up and running quickly. He's broken with past precedent by moving with uncharacteristic, indeed unprecedented speed to put in place his economic financial team and his foreign policy national security team. In fact, there was an article in the Financial Times this morning that said he has moved faster with respect to appointing his top economic advisors than has ever occurred in US history. He has turned to experienced people. So the people at the top of his team will be able to get up and running quickly. But it's going to take time to fill the lower positions. And it's time that the administration can ill afford. We can see it already that we're confronting a contradiction in our political system with the collapse of Detroit looming and a new administration unable to act as an administration and a Congress that is about to be phased out and replaced by a new Congress. So time is really of the essence right now, and this is going to be a major determinant of whether the Obama administration gets off to a strong start or fumbles the ball early and then has difficulty playing catch-up ball. These factors can be expected to limit the amount of attention that the new administration can give to Asia. But it cannot neglect Asia. China's economy is too closely interlinked with the American economy for any American government trying to deal with our economic crisis not to have to factor in the important China component. And the second factor is that it cannot neglect the North Korean nuclear issue. This has a potential to destabilize East Asia in a severe way. Because if North Korea becomes an established nuclear weapons state, there is going to be proliferation, and it will be extraordinarily difficult to try to hold it back. Where it will lead is anybody's guess, but it will make the world a much less secure place. So these are issues that the economic crisis alone cannot divert you from paying attention to. Now, any new administration, when it takes office, of course, has to deal with the immediate issues that it has on its plate. But American foreign policy will lack coherence if top policymakers don't relate their current decisions to the longer range goals that they're trying to achieve. There's an interesting contrast between China's leadership that speaks confidently about where they want China to be 20 or 30 years from now, and the fact that if you talk 20 or 30 months from now in Washington, you seem to be outside the realm 
of the relevant. People tend to be very short-sighted in the U.S. government, and no administration has ever set out what I would call longer-term goals for where they would like to go. And incidentally, those goals do not have to be restricted to the life of an administration. I see no reason why President Obama shouldn't be able to say that in 2020, here is the United States that he would like to see, and the steps that he will take during his administration are testable in terms of whether they lead in that direction or are contradictory. But we don't do this sort of thing. Now, why is this important? We're about to mark the 30th anniversary of the establishment of U.S.-China diplomatic relations. And we're trying to think about where China is heading, but I think the right starting point for that is to look at what has happened over the last 30 years briefly. 30 years ago, China was just coming out of the Cultural Revolution. The average Chinese peasant earned less than a dollar a day. The possibility that China would become an economic colossus within a few decades would have been dismissed primarily by the experts who knew China best as an impossible dream. The United States 30 years ago still officially recognized the Republic of China on Taiwan as the government of all of China. The Soviet Union had not yet invaded Afghanistan. The Soviet Union still represented a formidable challenge to the United States, and nobody anticipated that a leader such as Gorbachev would emerge within a few years and implement policies of glasnost and perestroika that led to the quick demise of the Soviet U Union. German reunification was a distant dream. The Berlin Wall seemed as permanent as the Great Wall of China. The Iron Curtain still divided Europe, and the military dictator of South Korea, Park Chung-hee, had just been assassinated, and nobody saw Korea on a path toward democratic governance. So this is the world 30 years ago, and I think it's fair to say that no one would have imagined the enormity of the changes that have occurred over the last three decades. The collapse of the Soviet Empire, the rise of China, and the transformation of the Chinese Communist Party in ways that would make it unrecognizable to Karl Marx. The virtual disappearance of an ideologically supported alternative to market-based capitalism as the most reliable path to rapid economic development. This is a very significant feature because while Americans have been glorying in our status as the sole superpower, the really relevant consideration is that the world has not been unipolar for a long time and is no longer divided into irreconcilable ideological differences. This is the first time since the Russian Revolution in 1917 that Europe and Asia have not been divided by deep philosophical differences over how to organize economic systems. This is a remarkable period in world history. Given these dramatic and largely positive developments, think for a moment whether this would have happened if the United States and the People's Republic of China had not established diplomatic relations 30 years ago. Given the expectations raised by President Nixon's visit to China in 1972, I think we can reasonably assume that a prolonged U.S. delay in willingness to establish diplomatic relations with China would have created major difficulties in U.S.-China relations. President Reagan would have inherited a deeply troubled relationship with China. China's reform and openness policies, if they had been launched at all, would have lacked the impetus provided by the virtually simultaneous establishment of U.S.-China diplomatic relations. The United States position in the final stages of the Cold War would have been significantly weaker because of the tensions in our relations with China, and this could have affected developments in the Soviet Union. If normalization had been delayed until Deng Xiaoping, 
left the political stage in China. It's questionable whether there was any Chinese leader who would have had the authority to handle the complications introduced by the Taiwan issue into the working out of the normalization relations with China. Conceivably, the Tiananmen incident would not have occurred because reform and openness might have occurred at a slower pace, but the benefits of this would have been offset by the complicated state of the US-China relationship. Now, dealing with historical ifs is always risky. But in this case, it's not unreasonable to suppose that both China and the world would look very different and probably much worse if the United States had not completed the normalization process three decades ago. Now, given these retrospective considerations, in looking down the road, we should be sober and daring in our assumptions. We should be sober in the sense that we should recognize that we cannot straight line what has happened in the recent past and expect the world to roughly approximate that down the road. Now, the problem with not using straight line projections is that probably any other system of projecting the future is less accurate than a straight line projection. But we know that straight line projections are always inaccurate. So we have to be very sober in making, in understanding that our assumptions about the future are not likely to work out the way we think they may. And that's why we have to be daring, because we have to recognize how the world is changing right before our eyes in ways that are going to negate the assumptions that we are used to making about the world around us. In fact, I think we would be wise to assume that the East Asia that emerges several decades from now will not be the East Asia that we think will exist down the road. Lord Keynes is receiving a lot of attention these days, and he once wrote that the inevitable never happens, it is always the unexpected. The reality I would present is that 2009 is likely to be a defining moment in world affairs that could be just as significant in its longer term consequences as the collapse of the Soviet empire two decades ago. The current financial crisis is likely to mark the end of the unconstrained hubris that seized the American people with the end of the Cold War, permitting the notion to emerge that we could sustain our dominant position indefinitely, that we could end tyranny in the world, and that we could use our power to reshape the world to our liking. What has not yet sunk home in our thinking is the degree to which the assumption that capitalism, market economics, and democratic governance are superior in their approach. This assumption has taken a body blow. The historians among you will recall that it was the discrediting of capitalism during the Great Depression and the failure of the post-World I democracies that sprang up in Europe that added luster to the false attractions of communism and authoritarian systems as alternative approaches. How should this impact on our assumptions looking down the road? Well, I think that we may see a restarting of the historical process that Francis Furukawa declared ended a while back. You know, partly tongue in cheek, his argument is that the dialectical process that was driving history forward had ended because market capitalism had essentially emerged as the accepted way of handling economic development around the world. And I suspect that we're going to find that assumption under challenge. We're going to be a different country in 2009 from the country we have been before. Our resources are limited. Our economic system has stumbled badly, and our political system has failed to anticipate the problem and has been belated and erratic in its response. For the last two decades, we have been thinking and acting as though we had unlimited resources, and the new Obama administration will find that our resources, vast as they are, are both limited and under severe strain. As Lee Hamilton put it in a recent article, 
Freedom and liberty aren't just universal abstractions that flow freely in presidential addresses and opinion pieces. They have concrete meaning, they have real costs, and there are limits to the lengths we will go in their name. We've been throwing around ideology in recent years, and now the reckoning is coming due, and we're going to have to be very practical in the way that we relate our resources to what needs to be done. The impact of the economic crisis on China is as relevant. How does China fit into all of this? Well, first, of course, we need to see how the current economic crisis impacts on the development process in China itself. In the Asian financial crisis a decade ago, China was insulated from the impact because of its non-convertible currency, its capital controls, and because its integration into the global economy had not received yet the boost provided by its entry into the World Trade Organization in 2001. China still has a high degree of insulation from the current financial crisis, but there is no question that a global economic recession or depression affecting China's major export markets is having an effect in China. The rate of growth of China's economy is slowing so rapidly that China's leaders are worried and are taking stimulus efforts to try to increase the rate of growth barely after they have been taking measures to try to slow down the rate of growth. What is not yet clear is whether this will continue to a point that plunges the country into a domestic economic crisis. We can postulate various alternative outcomes. One would be, and I heard this view in Beijing a couple of weeks ago when I was there, which is that China will emerge from the economic crisis sooner and in a stronger position relatively than the United States, and that China will help to, be, to pull the developed countries of the West up because its economy will revive more quickly. But another possibility is that the crisis exacerbates domestic difficulties in China in ways that exceed the ability of China's leaders to cope, thus plunging China into a period of domestic instability. Of the two, I consider the first marginally more likely because China's leaders so far seem capable of handling any immediate instability issues. And unlike our own government, they have a tendency to focus on the problems that need to be focused on and to adopt measures quickly to try to address those problems. However, we should also consider some of the longer-term consequences that could flow from a breakdown of stability in China. That's one of those possibilities that could alter the picture of the world three decades from now. I do not predict it, but it's one of the things that could happen. Second, as we look down the road, we should assume that the current travails of the Western economic systems will sharpen the ideological debate inside China over how fast and how rapidly China should go down this path. The Western media are filled with stories about the widening gaps between the, West, between the wealthy and the rest of the people in our own societies, and how the financial crisis is disproportionately affecting those less well off. I read some of these stories in the papers this morning as I was flying up here to Boston. This is certain to have resonance in China, where the issue of income disparities has already become a serious political issue, and where there have been leftist attacks on China's reform and openness policies. Those people were beaten back in connection with the 17th Party Congress but they are going to have new ammunition based on the failures of the Western economies to cope adequately with the financial problems that they were accumulating. If China escapes the worst of a global economic downturn, this will legitimize China's form of market socialism with Chinese characteristics, and we could find a renewed competition between alternative ways of managing economic systems re-emerging in the world. Third, if we adopt a longer-term perspective, 
We should not underestimate the impact of generational change in China over the next few decades. China's fifth generation leaders will assume the top positions in 2012, and it will be the first generation of Chinese leaders that rose to political maturity during the period of reform and openness. They will be confronted with a never-ending set of problems generated by China's rapid transformation, but their responses will be influenced by their greater familiarity with the outside world and China's growing integration in the global economy. In other words, the problems may be similar to problems before, but their approaches will reflect a generational and attitudinal difference in how to deal with those problems. It's like your children. You raise them to be like you, but they always have a different perspective on the world. And one of the areas where the US intelligence community failed most egregiously in assessing Gorbachev when he emerged in, Ru in Russia was they failed to take into account that he was a generation younger than the Brezhnev, Chernyenko, Andropov uh, leadership that had preceded him. So generational change matters because you respond to the challenges you have to deal with differently. Third, if we adopt a longer perspective, well, excuse me. I'm trying to take a long perspective here. I talked about 2012. Let's talk about 2020, because then the sixth generation of China's leaders takes office, and this will be the group that essentially has no memories of the Cultural Revolution whatsoever. Their entire lives will have been lived in a China that has been much more open to the outside world than anything preceding them. Fourth, if China continues on a growth path, the new middle classes that will emerge in China over the course of the next two or three decades will confront China with strong, and I would argue, irresistible pressures for systemic political reforms. The question, as always, will be whether such reforms can take place under conditions of stability or whether any loosening of China's political constraints will unleash uncontrollable domestic forces that will make the country less governable. In a way, it's an unanswerable question. Elsewhere in Asia, we have seen this process play itself out with almost 100 percent reliability. Every country in East Asia that has sustained 40 years of rapid economic development has moved from authoritarian governance to democratic forms of government, not always stably, as we see in Thailand today, but that process has no exceptions. But the trouble in China is, can you have a stable political situation under such conditions because we have no historical precedents to look back to? There are no easy answers to the question, but we should remember that within greater China, there are already three political systems. You have the mainland system, you have the multi-party, somewhat chaotic democratic system in Taiwan, and you have the half and half system in Hong Kong and Macau. How these alternative systems function is going to have an impact on the issue of political reform within China, because these are not Western systems that are being foisted on China. These are Chinese managing their affairs in alternative ways. And therefore, it will be easier for Chinese on the mainland to say, if they can do it this way, why can't we? Those will be difficult questions to handle. Fifth, if China escapes the worst of the global recession and the United States emerges in a scaled down, but I emphasize, still a very significant leading position in the world, great powers don't lose their power very quickly most of the time. The Soviet Union in this respect was an exception. If you look at the British Empire, you can see that Britain actually took decades in order to move from its position as the dominant country in the world. But if China does well in the world, this is going to affect perceptions of China, both by outsiders and by Chinese themselves. It could be China's greatest danger. 
It could feed China threat theories abroad. Imagine how we're going to feel if we're still encountering major economic difficulties and China seems to be rising rapidly again. The ability to generate concepts of a China threat will be much easier. But at the same time, it could generate a type of dangerous hubris and nationalism on the part of the Chinese themselves. We saw this process in the United States. I like to emphasize that the Spanish-American War was a totally avoidable war. The Americans wanted it because we were emerging on this global stage. We were feeling our oats as a newly powerful country. And this was an expression, if you will, of our new sense of nationhood. That process could occur in China, the difference being that unlike the United States and the Western Hemisphere, China is surrounded by big, powerful countries. Whether three of them, four of them are nuclear armed, the United States is a major factor in the region, Japan, Russia, India, these are not small countries. So if China begins to feel its oats, the consequences are going to emerge very quickly, and this could be a sobering reality for China itself. Finally, the Taiwan issue. This is one of the areas that we should, in my judgment, discard our assumptions of the past. This issue cannot go on indefinitely if China continues to rise. Taiwan's security from hostile attack from the mainland has always been a function of the quality of cross-strait relations and of China, Taiwan's own military capabilities and preparedness. Assuming that neither the United States nor Japan changes their frameworks for managing the Taiwan issue, what will change is that Taiwan will necessarily have to depend more for its security on proper management of the cross-strait relationship than on its military strength. When China was relatively weak militarily, there could be some prospect of maintaining a military balance across the strait. But that possibility, if China continues to grow, is going to diminish over the decades ahead. Indeed, one could argue that it would be disastrous for Taiwan or for its friends to seek to rely primarily on military capabilities to maintain Taiwan's security. If China continues to grow and prosper, its military capabilities will sooner or later make it impossible to maintain a stable military balance across the Taiwan Strait, and efforts to do so will serve no one's interests except those of the arms sellers. That does not mean that Taiwan will necessarily be less secure. What it does mean is that greater reliance will have to be placed on managing the cross-strait relationship in a manner that keeps tensions low and permits common interests to grow. Now, recent developments in Taiwan show that's not an impossible goal. We've been through eight years of governance in Taiwan, during which cross-strait tensions have been high because of a lack of trust. But under the Ma Ying-jeou administration in Taiwan, we have seen a significant improvement in cross-strait relations with emergence of the three links and other possibilities for improving cross-strait relations. So this can go in different directions. But at the moment, there's no reason to be pessimistic about the ability of Taiwan to manage relations across the strait with a stronger mainland China than has been the case in the past. The one thing that we can be certain is that trying to rely on the military component to the same degree that it could be relied on in the past is likely to erode over the next few decades. There is no reason to assume that gloomy prospects are in store for us. China's GDP in 2006 was 13 times what it was in 1978, and yet US-China relations are better now than they were in 1978. So the idea that the United States is incapable of managing relations with a stronger and more prosperous China simply doesn't stand up to the facts. Such pessimism is no more warranted than rosy assumptions that the path ahead will be easy. If leaders in both countries recognize that each country's interests will be better served by cooperation rather than confrontation, 
then we have good grounds for optimism that the difficulties can be managed successfully, just as they have been for the last 30 years, and whatever surprising world emerges 30 years from now, both the United States and China will be playing a positive role in that world. But that's a historical if, and we'll have to see how it plays out. Thank you. I think I've answered all the questions, but if any... I can't imagine that anybody would have any, but uh, um, why don't we go over here. Just a couple okay. questions. We seem to be uh, economically attached to the hip to China in that they provide us huge amounts of imports. We provide them FDI. They buy our bonds. And uh, we have a sort of very sh – we're not shifting away from that. What is the Chinese attitude towards our economic relationship, both in terms of them providing us goods, but also them financing the purchase of those goods through purchasing of government bonds? The Chinese have been on the defensive in the past. We have been able to, with some credibility, bring constant pressure on them to address the trade imbalance on the grounds that reflects a currency that is undervalued and needs to appreciate. China's currency, in fact, did alter its value repeatedly over the period up to the Asian financial crisis in 1997. In 1997, China gained enormous credit throughout Asia by not devaluing its currency. And as a result, it let it become frozen, and this contributed to the trade imbalance between our two countries. What has shifted now is that China is no longer on the defensive, because we have shown that instead of being able to boast to the Chinese about how we have a well-managed economic system and that therefore can tell the Chinese how to manage their own economic and financial affairs, the Chinese no longer take that. And if you read the morning paper, there were some stories again about how Secretary Paulson was lectured by China's central bankers and economic leaders uh, about how we needed to correct some of our own deficiencies. But the fact of the matter is that we're all in the same boat together. And if we think that the Chinese export too much to us, we need to take actions to decrease our debt-fueled consumption, and then we're in a position to deal with China in terms of whether its savings rate is too high and they need to increase consumption patterns. At the moment, however, if you look at the economic stimulus packages that China has announced, China's export markets have taken such an enormous hit in the last couple of months that China, in fact, is trying to move back to an uh, a increase in domestic consumption as a way of keeping its economy stimulated. On balance, that's a good development. But the fact is that China still holds some $2 trillion of foreign exchange reserves, and that means that China is very much in the same boat with us in terms of how we play our role in the global economic system. All people realize how important is the relationship between America and China. But how can you say get the two countries trust each other, such in the international issues like Taiwan or Tibet? Now, at the most, you say, and have some harsh operations between these two countries. How can you improve this trust, trust between these two countries? Right. Fundamental question. How does mutual trust grow among and between leaders? Essentially, there's one pattern that causes trust to grow. That's for me to indicate to you how I intend to handle something, and then for you to see that what I told you, in fact, is a reliable guide to what I do. If you want to contribute to mistrust, mislead the other side. Give them an incorrect impression about how you will handle something, and then they will not trust you. So in this area, China and the United States 
have an enormous mistrust component they have to deal with, partly because we don't talk honestly and transparently about what we want to do, or we talk in ways that create mistrust on the other side. For example, this administration has said that we want to remain the dominant power indefinitely in the world. Well, that's going to create mistrust in China. It not only creates mistrust in China, it creates mistrust everywhere else because no other country shares that goal. And it's crazy for a country to adopt a national security strategy that nobody else shares. Usually, you want to find common interests with other countries, and we have defined our national security strategy in ways that deny us common interests with other countries. So with China, what we need to do is to build on the framework that has already emerged, which is the strategic economic dialogue and the political dialogue that we've had. President Bush, to his great credit, has had an enormously greater number of meetings with the presidents of China, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, over the last eight years than any previous president by a factor of four to five times. These are the types of relationships that are helpful. When I was ambassador in China, I had all sorts of high-level officials in the United States fantasizing about how China might be forming a strategic partnership with Iran against the United States. I met with these leaders frequently. And anyone who thought that these people were so stupid as to link China's future interests to a strategic partnership with Iran as compared to its interests in having a good relationship with the United States had to be fantasizing. It's easy to fantasize about people you don't know and have never met or have never had serious conversations with. Trust emerges from knowing the other party and believing that they mean what they say. And so I think that that is what we have to work on. Uh, I, th I think there's a real potential for building strategic trust between the United States and China. We aren't there yet, and it's frankly a dangerous area in the relationship that we need to address. Thank you. If I were to summarize the whole morning's discussion uh, on China's development over the past 30 years, it is so far so good. So I really appreciate your uh, seasoned and more sober uh, view of China's outlook, uh, what could go wrong. And uh, <clears throat> so if there is a possibility for China's uh, development path to be set on a uh, downward uh, spiraling, uh, what will be some of the triggering uh, events or issues, if you will, besides the worldwide financial crisis that's un still unfolding and besides the Taiwan issue you alerted earlier. So in a sense, I want to hear more uh, bad news uh, or worst case scenario, if you will. Thank you. I tend to be an optimist rather than a pessimist. And here's the reason. If you look around the world, you find that we have almost 200 countries most of whom are not failing in a miserable fashion. If we look at the ones that are failing, look at their leaders. They are not addressing the problems they should be addressing. In East Asia, we have North Korea. China has known for 30 years what North Korea should be doing. It should be engaging in some Korean form of reform and openness. They haven't, and as a result, China has had strained relations with North Korea because they think North Korea is not doing what it should do. Same thing applies to Myanmar, Burma. Here again is a country that is not addressing the problems that are keeping them in a backward state. 30 years ago, Burma had twice the per capita income of Indonesia. In Indonesia, before the Asian financial crisis, had nearly 10 times the per capita income of Burma. That's the difference. Leaders who don't address the problems they need to address. China's current leaders are focusing on the immediate problems. If China's leaders were running the United States, we wouldn't be talking about an underfunded Social Security obligation. We wouldn't be talking about a health care system that isn't being addressed, because they would be addressing those questions. We have kept putting them off. 
So that's the reason why all of the pessimists about China stumbling at some point in this remarkable pattern of economic growth have kept themselves from disaster because they are constantly looking at the problems that are being generated and finding ways to deal with it. What you find globally is that when leaders address the problems that need to be addressed, most of the time they can't solve them, but they can keep them manageable. So as long as China has leaders that focus on the areas that they need to focus on, I think China is going to manage to keep moving in the right direction. But sometimes external events impact on you in ways that exceed the ability of leaders to cope. You know, look at pre-World War II Europe. It's hard to think how a Poland could have developed an effective strategy for dealing with the contradictions between Germany and the Soviet Union at that time. So sometimes you can be overwhelmed by events. But China and the United States are two countries that if our leaders focus on what needs to be done, I think we can keep the problems manageable. So I'm not a pessimist. But if something horrible happens, then you have to reassess your assumptions. Because even leaders can be, even good leaders can be overwhelmed when events become too great for them to manage. Thank you. Mm -hmm.